Well, I'll say hello to everyone. Since it's a makeup class, the uh, classroom is not quite filled, but we have a couple of dedicated students here, so that's good. So um, last class, I was showing some output from an optical profiler, and there was a, an output number for R sub Z. And uh, come on in. And uh, I was asked, what's the definition of R sub Z? And I couldn't remember the definition of R sub Z. So after class, I went to Google. And Google remembered the definition of R sub Z. But now that I see it, I think I see why I've forgotten it. But anyway, let's look at it here. So R sub Z is a 10-point height. And what we do, we take the average absolute value of the five highest peaks and the five lowest valleys. And uh, from that, we take the peaks, add them up, subtract from that the valleys, and divide by five. And uh, gives us the um, R sub Z. Now, I'm not too sure why this is such an important parameter, but I can see it, it might be better than peak to valley. Peak to valley, you could have just one point off, and that could throw the peak to valley off a lot. At least here, you kind of average that down, and it wouldn't have such a, a large effect. So R sub Z. If you go to the, um, well, go to Google, you'll find that there's uh, hundreds of these different parameters that uh, people like. And I remember back in the WICO days that um, it seemed like, every instrument the customer would want another one of these so we ended up putting a lot of these into the into the software okay last class we were going through the leo test so let me just go over a couple of three slides that i had gone over before and then we'll go on to some new new material remember the leo test which is uh, maybe more often called the zernike phase contrast test is where we're looking at a sample, and I'm almost at normal incidence, and our calculations will assume we're at normal incidence. And we take the uh, our light source, we focus it down here, and at the image of the light source, we place a mask. And I'll talk about the mask in the next slide. And then we go over here to where this lens is imaging the sample, and we look at the irradiance distribution across the sample. Now, this is going to be useful for measuring very small heights variations. And so the mask is going to be the intensity transmittance for the center portion of the mask is going to be A squared. And that's really the, uh, the central portion of the airy disk. Uh, we'll have it, um, so we're attenuating the non-diffracted, non-scattered light. Outside of this small mask in the middle here, uh, we're going to have essentially 100 percent transmittance. And then the other thing is in the mask area, we change the phase by either plus 90 degrees or minus 90 degrees, i.e. 270 degrees if you want. And um, then we can say, well, we can write the uh, reflected beam as e to the i 2 pi over lambda times 2 times z, where we're assuming normal incidence. If it were not normal incidence, then there would be a cosine theta here, theta being the angle of incidence. And the idea is that if z is a very small fraction of a wave, z over lambda is small, and we could expand this simply as 1 plus 2 pi over lambda 2z times i. So now what we're going to do is we're going to put in some attenuation to attenuate this 1 by some amount amplitude-wise to a, and we're going to put in a phase here of either plus 90 degrees or minus 90 degrees. And so we could rewrite that as just some overall transmittance uh, of the filter function here times a i plus 2 times 2 pi over lambda z times i. And we'll square that. And if z over lambda a, or maybe I should say a 4 pi, z over lambda a is small, then when we expand that, we can neglect the z over a squared term. And we simply have here the irradiance goes as some number plus another number times z. So we're going to have an irradiance distribution in this image plane. 
that is proportional to the height variation on the sample. And uh, I just made a little table here. I say, well, let z be 10 angstroms and let a vary. a is 1, 0 0.56, 0 0.32, 0 0.18, and so on. And this would give us the irradiance change we would get due to the height of 10 angstroms. And if, uh, now this would be the linear relationship. If um, z over a is not small enough, we have to take into the account the square term here. And um, uh, I plotted that, or I printed that out here in the last row. And so we see it as a gets small, smaller, the sensitivity becomes larger. 10 angstroms produces a larger change in the irradiance. But as A gets too small, then we depart from this linear relationship a little bit. And then we also said that in, um, in practice here, what we often get here, or what we often use, is not a point source because we don't have a lot of light from that, maybe. But we'll use an angular source. And now this filter is going to just cover the geometrical image of this um, source. And this is going more towards incoherent illumination. And so we also get uh, uh, maybe some higher frequencies through the system. Um, any questions on this? And then just looking at some results, uh, which I took from uh, volume one of the Atlas of Optical Phenomena. This was for a lens that had been pitch polished. And uh, I mean, it's a very, very sensitive test. Very sensitive. Looking at angstroms. Um, this is looking at some striations. And we also see some spots here that are due to either pits on the surface or dust on the surface, which is a, a problem with the, I mean, we're, we're sensitive to any, any scattered light. And so if we have any dust on the surface, we will see that as well as we'll see the pits or the defects in the surface or the sample. And then I don't think I showed this one last time. This is we claim as pits in the glass, but I'm willing to bet that some of this is certainly dust. And then we have a bright region around the outside, and that's just due to diffraction uh, around the outside of the sample. So this is a, a, a good way to look at samples. And you, I mean, if you calibrate it, you can indeed measure heights uh, by measuring the change in the irradiance. But I think more often it's, it's used as a qualitative test. And I didn't mention this is a Slarin test here. So this was making A equal to 0. So we're cutting out all of the non-diffracted light. Now, I had some comments here from Hilbert Highstone, or Herbert Highstone, I should say. Does anyone here know who Herbert Highstone is? I have to say, I have no idea myself who he is. But one day I got an email. I guess I'd had something on the, my website on allele test. And so Herbert Highstone sent me an email with some comments about the Leo test. And it sounds like he has uh, he's done quite a lot of, of uh, work in this area. So I thought I would copy a little bit out of his email. And uh, what he says is that he's made his Leo plates, the phase plates, using candle soot. And so he first smokes a, a glass plate with a candle flame. And then he uses a, a straight edge and scraper to form the phase shifting element. Now I said, it, you know, if we had a point source, the mass would just be a small circular region. I think what he's doing here, he has a line source. And so his phase strip is a line. Essentially, the 
covering up the geometrical image of the source. And then he goes on to think of this as a, an image processor, which I guess it is, and it emphasizes certain special frequencies. And he makes the, the good point that if we make the source slit width small, then we're getting lower frequencies through the system. And um, it becomes, uh, becomes more sensitive. So anyway, that's Herbert Highstone's comments. If anyone's greatly interested in the Leo test, you probably could send an email to him. Some other references that um, uh, I found useful over the years. The first one is one that uh, um, was published in um, uh, Advances in Optical and Electron Microscopy. Uh, it's, a, it's an old publication, but this is a very old test. And um, he again talks about using soot to uh, make the filter. And then he says to pour some, um, uh, to kind of fix this soot, you pour some alcohol over it. And then it's more resistant to mechanical damage. And uh, I, I uh, have never uh, made a Leo filter this way, but it sounds, sounds kind of interesting. And then this is another paper that I, this one actually has some very nice results in it um, in applied optics a long, again, a long time ago. Um, and uh, he was uh, doing work on polishing of surfaces, polishing of super smooth surfaces. And I don't know what the definition of a super smooth surface is. It, I think it depends on who you talk to. For me, it's something smoother than an angstrom or a mess, but I think that Typically, maybe it's a little rougher than that. Two or three angstroms are a mess. But anyway, a very smooth surface. And he goes on to say that this is a good way of checking it as you're, as you're polishing it and um, keeping track of it as it becomes better and better. And in his paper, he published this uh, uh, result for a mirror that I guess he was, was working on. And... Uh, the point I want to make here is that this test really is very, very sensitive. And um, uh, if you really want to tell if something is smooth or not, I mean, you can use an interferometer if you want, but this is, uh, is at least as sensitive and uh, it may not be so easy to get numbers out of, but you can certainly tell um, when you're getting closer and closer to a, a, a very smooth surface. So that's the Leo test, or the Zernike phase contrast test goes by both, both names. Any questions? OK. OK, now I'm going to go on to certainly one of my favorite topics. It's what's called the FICO interferometer. And you may have had that in 505. Some of you have seen the FICO before. Have you all seen the FICO before? Or? No, okay. Well, to be completely truthful, I'm not sure the FICO is used much anymore. But I really like it um, because it's a very good demonstration of interferometry with white light. It's also the, the very first way that, that I was able to measure uh, surface roughness in the angstrom or maybe even sub-angstrom range. And uh, we used to have a FICO interferometer on the fifth floor of the building here. I don't know if it's still there or not. I haven't looked in a long time. But uh, I had a lot of fun playing with it once. And uh, it's, not, it's not something that's too well known, uh, or too widely known, maybe I should say. I think it's well known, but not widely known. And uh, so let's go through it here and see how it works. It's kind of kind of interesting, I think. So it's going to be a multiple beam interferometer. So we're going to have to work with surfaces that are coated, which is going to be a drawback maybe. But anyway, it has to be high reflectivity surface so we can get very sharp interference fringes. It's going to work with a white light source. And so that's uh, kind of nice. Um, what we're going to do, and I'll have a diagram for it in a second here, is that the sample is going to be focused on to the entrance slit of a spectrograph. 
and we basically are going to measure what wavelengths are transmitted by what well, we take the sample and we put it right next to a reference mirror to get multiple beam interference and we're going to measure what wavelengths are transmitted through this and each fringe will give a profile of the distance between the test surface and the reference surface for that little line portion that we're focusing on the, the entrance slit. Now I'm sure all of you have gone through multiple beam interference and you've uh, derived the equations for the reflectance and for the transmission. And we're going to use this equation here for the transmission for uh, a multiple beam in interferometer. I'm not going to derive it. You've, you've seen it before. If you, you can go to a you know, hex book or you can go to Born and Wolf or whatever and go through the derivation. It's not too complicated. But we're going to get the result that the light transmitted through will go as some maximum value divided by 1 plus F sine squared of delta over 2. Where a delta here is the phase difference for each uh, double pass through the interferometer. It goes 2 pi over the wavelength, 2 nd cosine theta. And then if we have some phase changes on reflection, and for this expression here, I'm saying that each surface introduces the same phase change on reflection of phi. And so delta here is 2 pi over lambda 2 nd cosine theta plus 2 pi, uh, plus 2 phi, I should say. Phi is the phase change on reflection at each surface. And the F here, does anyone remember what the F depends upon? If not, that could be your grade, I don't know. But no. Well, it depends on the reflectivity of the surfaces. And the higher the reflectivity, the larger F becomes. And in fact, the expression for F is that it's four times the intensity reflectivity divided by 1 minus r, the intensity reflectivity, quantity squared. So 4r over 1 minus r squared. And you don't really need to remember that, except remember that as r gets closer and closer to 1, that 1 minus r becomes smaller and smaller, and f becomes very large. And so what we, if we want real sharp fringes, we want f to be a large number. And so that means we want r, the reflectivity, to be close to 1. OK, so that's our basic equation, which you've seen before, uh, transmission for a uh, multiple beam interference. OK, so now we're going to play around with delta here a little bit. And um, so what we're going to do, we're going to take a, a very smooth surface. That would be our reference. And then we have our test. And both these are going to have high reflectivity. We're going to put these two close together, and we're going to measure the variation in the uh, thickness of this film between the two, variation in the distance between the two surfaces, and that's going to give us the height variation of the sample we're measuring. And the setup here is the following. White light source. And I'll say it's a point source. You know, it could be a slit source. But uh, let me just, for simplicity, let's say it's a point source. We'll collimate the light, so a collimated light here. And here we have the two surfaces that we're comparing. One of these will be a reference, and the other is a sample. And it doesn't matter which one comes first. We're really going to measure the distance between these two plates. And that variation in distance will... Um, give us the height variation on the reference surface, excuse me, on the sample, assuming the reference surface is, is perfect. We're really measuring the difference between the two. I'm going to take a lens, and I'm going to image this sample onto a slit. And that slit is the entrance slit for a spectrometer. And so I have a lens, which will put that slit at infinity, uh, I'll use a prism here. It could be a grating, but I'll use a prism here. And then a lens and the images the slit back here. So we're imaging the slit 
into this plane. And we're going to have dispersion in the, in the plane of the screen here. So coming out of the screen will be an image of the slit. Um, and what we're going to measure, really, is what colors get through this interferometer back here. So what colors are focused onto the slit? And so here we'll get an image of that. And let me, I'll come back to these equations, but let's just go to the next uh, uh, slide here, and then I'll, I'll come back to this to look at the equations. So what I'm seeing is I'm getting an image of the slit. And so it's imaged in the y direction. And in the x direction, that's my wavelength due to the dispersion here from this prism. And so when I image that slit, if I have different colors in different portions of the slit, then the image of that slit will not be a straight line, but it's going to show me what wavelengths are present. And I'm going to have fringes of various orders, m, m plus 1, m plus 2, and so on. So I know from previous times I've taught this, this sometimes is confusing. So I want to make sure you understand what this drawing is. And then we'll go back and the equations are pretty simple. But I want to, you have to understand what this drawing is. Everyone understands it. Or else you don't understand it well enough to ask a question about it. I don't know which it is. So this is wavelength this way. So that's due to dispersion of the prism. So it's wavelength this way. And it's an image of a slit this way. And so that's coming out of the plane of the screen. And so I'm really measuring what wavelengths are going in here, which is measuring what wavelengths are getting through here. So I'm imaging a line portion of this onto here, and we're going to see what wavelengths are transmitted by this multiple beam interferometer along that line. OK. Ready to go on to the equations? So if we go back here to our basic equation for multiple beam interference, I see that if f is a large number, which means that the reflectivity is close to 1, if f is a large number, this is going to be 0 most of the time, except when the sine is equal to 0. And when the sine is equal to 0, regardless what f is, this is going to be i max over 1. So I want to know what values of delta well, the sine of delta over 2 be equal to 0. Well, sine of delta over 2 is equal to 0 when delta over 2 is an integer number of pi's. Okay? So I'm going to look at this equation here, and I'm going to see when that's equal to an integer number of pi's. And I'm going to say, well, I'm at normal incidence, so I, the cosine of theta becomes 1. So I'm going to see when 2 pi over lambda, 2 nd, plus 2 phi is equal to an integer number of pi's. And so, and, it's, and I'm going to also, I didn't say that, I'm going to let refractive index be 1. I'm just saying it's an air, oops, and it's an air film inside of here. And so that is saying then that I'm going to get a bright fringe of order m one phi over pi plus 2d over lambda is equal to m, simply coming from setting that equal to m pi. So that will give me a bright fringe. And then I can say, well, that's going to occur at a wavelength of, I just solve for the wavelength. So the wavelength is 2d over m minus phi over pi. And that's the wavelength for order m. So I call that lambda sub m. OK. So that's not too bad. Now, phi here is my phase change on reflection. And just to make life simple, I assume that both surfaces have the same phase change on reflection. 
The other thing I'm going to do, and this is a, an assumption, but it's a pretty good one. I'm going to say that over the range of wavelengths I'm looking at, phi is a constant. I mean, in real life, phi will depend a little bit on wavelength, but we're going to be looking over a short range of wavelengths. So we'll say phi is a constant over that range of wavelengths. And I look at this, and it says, now, it's, first off, what is D? D is a separation between my reference and my sample. Okay? And uh, this is kind of neat. It says that for a given fringe, D over lambda is a constant. And so if I make D a little bit larger, then the wavelength that gets through will also become a little bit larger for that fringe. Okay, everyone buy that? So we have this expression here, this expression there, and I could solve this for D if I want to. And if I solve that for D, I mean, it's very simple. I get D is M minus phi over pi times lambda over 2. Okay, so D is M minus phi over pi times lambda over 2. So that's D. So if I look at that fringe here, which was an image of that slit, I look at that fringe, I look at, at that point right there, if I measure that wavelength, I know that D is equal to M minus phi over pi times whatever that wavelength is over 2. So only if, I mean, if, if I knew what M minus phi over pi was, then I would know what D was. Unfortunately, I don't know that yet, but I soon will. And I look along this image of the slit, so that's along a slit portion of the sample. I can say, well, D here minus D there, so D2 minus D1 is M minus phi over pi times whatever that wavelength is, lambda 2, point 2 of order M, minus whatever that wavelength is, which is lambda 0.1 of order m over 2. So, to find the difference in d's here, I just have to measure this wavelength and that wavelength, and if only I knew what this was, then I would know what the change in separation was between the two samples. Assuming one of the samples is flat, I would know how the height of the other sample varied. Okay, any questions yet? Because now some way what I have to do, or what I'm going to make you do, is figure out what m minus phi over pi is. And to do that, I can say, well, you know, I, I have this point one here. And this is fringe of order m, and this is fringe of order m plus one. And point one here has some D associated with that. I don't know what it is right now, but there's some D associated with that. And it's the same D. I mean, it's the same point. It's the same D. So I can say that, you know, D here, which is M minus phi over pi times lambda over 2, is equal to, or over here is the same expression, except now the order number is m plus 1, and the wavelength is now, well, it's lambda for point 1, but order m plus 1. So, for point 1, fringe orders m and m plus 1, I know that m minus phi over pi times lambda, point 1, order m, is equal to m plus 1 minus phi over pi, lambda, point 1, order m plus 1. And now I can do algebra here to solve for m minus phi over pi, and that's simply lambda 0.1 order m plus 1 divided by lambda 0.1 order m, lambda 0.1 order m plus 1. So now I take this expression here for m minus phi over pi, and I plug it in here, and I'm going to solve for d2 minus d1. And so d2 minus d1 then is 
I'll just read it off. So it's lambda 0.1 order m plus 1 divided by lambda 0.1 order m minus lambda 0.1 order m plus 1 times lambda 2 0.2 order m minus lambda 1 point m over 2. And so I simply measure this wavelength. I measure that wavelength. And I measure that wavelength. So I measure three wavelengths using my spectrometer. And I solve for d2 minus d1. Okay. Any questions at that point? And you know, I've done this, and it, it really does work well. Works very well. I've done it many times. Yeah, this is my spectrometer. And I'm going to have some little dial or something on a spectrometer. You know, the old-fashioned uh, spectrometer, I'd be looking in here an eyepiece at the fringes. And I would set a crosshair on here, and it would tell me what that wavelength is, and set a crosshair on there, and that wavelength, and so on. And so I would actually measure these three wavelengths, plug that into this expression, and that gives me the height difference on the sample between here and, and here. So I could do that from any points across the sample. And here's the next is a picture. I stole this from Born and Wolf's book. Uh, actual photograph of uh, the output of a spectrometer. Uh, so as we're looking at a diamond crystal. And I mean, you, the fringes, if, if the reflectivity is high, how many of you have seen multiple beam interference fringes? Not not too much. I mean, when you look at the multiple beam interference fringes, the fringes are very sharp if the, high, if the reflectivity is high. And so I would simply measure off this scale, you know, what, what wavelength is that? What wavelength is that? And then I need one point over here. And from that, I would get what the step was here, what the height variation was. And since D2 minus D1 is proportional, to lambda 2 order m minus lambda 1 order m, the profile of the cross-section of the sample is obtained simply by looking at a, at a fringe here on a scale proportional to the wavelength. Now, I know the first time people see this, it, 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 is, it can be confusing because it's kind of different from what you normally think of in interferometry. But um, the whole secret is we, we get very sharp fringes by having high reflectivities here. And so when I image this sample on my slits, I'm only seeing a slit portion of the sample. I'm only getting certain wavelengths through here. And the wavelengths are going to be the ones that, you know, f is a large number. And so it's really going to be when this sign here is equal to zero. And so I can solve for the d's and the wavelengths for which that's true. And that's, so that gives me the wavelengths to get through. I measure these wavelengths, and from that I get the height variations. Works very well. So what's good about it, and what's bad about it? Well, I mean, first off, the slit is looking at only a narrow section of the sample. Um, and each fringe is a profile of the variation of D in that section of the sample. And there's an exact point-to-point -point correspondence between the region we're looking at and the image on the slit. So, you know, as I look along this fringe, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between points along this fringe and points on the sample. 
Small changes in D are determined by measuring small changes in the wavelength. And you're, we're very good at measuring wavelengths, so that's why this is a very sensitive test. The next point I love, I mean, there's no ambiguity at a discontinuity of whether a region is a hill or a valley because we know D over lambda is a, is a constant here. And so if the wavelength increases, D is increased. There's no question about it. And if you're missing data points along that fringe, well, that's okay. You're not losing track here because you simply by, by measuring the wavelength, you know, if the wavelength becomes larger, you know that D becomes larger. That's all there is to it. So there's never any ambiguities about whether we have a hill or a valley. And if you look at how well you can measure wavelength, I mean, you can measure here in the angstrom or sub-angstrom range. I mean, you've, I've, I've done it. It works. It works very well. But not everything is fantastic here about the FICO. I mean, first off, one complaint is we're measuring data only along a line. And so if you want to measure a whole sample, you have to measure a lot of lines. Okay. So that's one thing you might not like. The second thing is that the sample being measured has to have a high reflectivity. So it's great if, if you're measuring a, a flat mirror that already has a high reflectivity coating on it, you're in business. But if you're measuring a bare piece of glass, first thing you have to do is to coat the surface. Now, we say, well, we can measure down into the angstrom range. Well, when you coat that surface, does the coating follow the surface down to the angstrom range? Yeah, that's questionable, I would say. So as I say, I love the FICO. I think it, it's, uh, it's very cool. And probably the reason I love it is that, I mean, it's been around a long, long time. It was, a, it was an old... Uh, measurement when I was a young kid. But it was the first way that I could measure a sample down to the angstrom range. And I, I remember how, how impressed I was that you could, you could do that. It just seems amazing that you could do it. OK, so any questions on the fecal? I warn you, I love it. So you might see it on a test or something. Okay, the next measurement here is also something I love. The Namarsky interferometer, sometimes called the Differential Interference Contrast Interferometer, DIC. Have any of you used the Namarsky? No. The Namarsky is, is pretty widely used, and we can get numbers out of it. But for the most part, people don't use it to get numbers. It's more of a, of a qualitative test. And what we're going to measure on this will be height variation. I mean, slope variations. We're going to measure slope, not height. We're measuring slope variations. And it's going to make use of, well, we're going to use polarized light. And it's going to make use of the Wollaston prism. And... Um, you see the Wollaston a lot, and I, I have to say that I love it. I've, I love it so much. My very first job out of college, I worked at the iTech Corporation. And when I left iTech to come out here, I stole only one thing, a Wollaston prism. I just could not leave that Wollaston prism there. And I still have that Wollaston prism in my desk. Maybe I should lock my desk, but I don't. But it's in there. It's uh, oh, I love that thing. It's great. I mean, you can buy them. I didn't have to steal it, but I did. Um, <clears throat> so the Wallison prism is made out of uh, birefringent crystals, calcite, quartz, uh, and it's made up of two little prisms here, put together. Well, the optical axes are uh, orthogonal to each other in the two sections of the, uh, of the prism. And so the light comes in here, and you have, say, uh, 
light coming in, you break it into S and the P components. And the two components are going to see a different refractive index in the sample here. And so one of these will see a higher refractive index, and the other one will see a lower refractive index. Um, whether it's parallel to or perpendicular to the optical, to the uh, crystal axis here. Then when we go into the second part of the prism, the prism is made such that the crystal axis now changed by 90 degrees. And so the state of polarization in the first part saw the higher refractive index. In the second part, we'll see the lower refractive index and vice versa. Okay. So the polarization in, in the first part of the Wallison prism sees the higher refractive index in the second part will see the lower, and vice versa. And so if I, and so as a result here, if I send in a beam of light, I'm going to get two beams out, and they're going to come out at slightly different angles. Okay. One will be bent to the left, and one will be bent to the right. And if I send this through here, right in the middle here, where I have the same amount of material above the hypotenuse that I have below, then the two polarizations are going to see the same optical thickness. But if I send the beam of light in, say, over to the left here, one polarization will see more of the high index, refractive index, than what the other polarization will see. So there will be a path difference between the two polarizations unless the beam is going right through the middle of this Wilson prism. So we're going to come over here to a microscope now. And I'm going to put in a white light source. And the beauty here it can be almost anything. It doesn't have to be a small source. We'll explain in a minute why that's true. And we're going to, you know, I'll put it on land, say, and make that at infinity. But we're going to put in a, a, a polarizer here. So light coming out of here will be polarized. And we'll probably make it at some angle. So I have both, when I go through the crystal here, I'm going to have both S and P components. Beam, spl uh, yeah, beam splitter here, down here to my Wallston prism. My microscope objective, my sample, light will go back through the microscope objective, through the Wollaston prism, through the beam splitter, to another polarizer called analyzer here, but it's just a polarizer. And this one may be parallel to this one, or it may be perpendicular, or maybe something in between. And then we'll come up here to where the image is. So the combination of this objective and whatever optics we have here will image the sample up here. And what you're going to see up there is something gorgeous. You're going to see just gorgeous colors. Ah, beautiful colors. Why, why do you see that? Well, that's kind of, I'm going to go back and forth between this slide and the next slide. So how does this Namarsky interferometer work? Well, first off, the polarizer sets the angle of polarization. OK, that's pretty clear. So whatever angle we put that, that will be our state of be linear polarization at some angle. The Wollaston will split the light into two beams having orthogonal polarization. So these, you know, light going through here Two polarizations will come out at different angles. So the light going through here afterwards, we're going to have these two beams coming out at different angles, and the two beams will have orthogonal polarization. Okay. We think here for a second, then these beams coming in at different angles, so that, you know, things, if I think of just a collimated beam of light, now we're really going to have a beams coming in at many different angles. But if I think for a second at just a collimated beam of light, then if I were to focus this down in a sample, I would have two spots. 
separated by each other, where the separation depends upon the angle between the two beams coming out of here, which depends upon our Wallace and Prism, and these two spots coming down here would have orthogonal polarization. Now, in real life, I'm going to have a sand, I'm going to have a source here that is extended. So I don't just have a collimated beam here. I have beams coming at many different angles. And so down here, I'm going to be illuminating some area of the surface. But I can think of it as two beams slightly displaced relative to one another and having orthogonal polarization. So I think that's what I say here. So I have... Two beams, oops, having orthogonal polarization, and they're sheared with respect to one another. Now, after reflection off the test surface, the beams are going to go back through the Wollaston prism, and this shear is going to be undone. Okay? So these beams are coming back. They were angular sheared going down here. And that's going to be undone when I come back. Ah. So it undoes the shear in the beam. And this is a great thing here. This means that spatial coherence of the source is not required. Everyone here remember the Van Sideret Zernike theorem? My Favorite theorem in all of optics, I guess. Anyway, if saying if I don't have any shear here, I don't need any special coherence. And so that says I can use any source I want here, really. I can use, I mean, it doesn't have to be a point source. It can be an extended source because I, I shear it and then I unshear it again. And then a fixed polarizer, or analyzer, I call it here, placed after the Wollaston will transmit like components of the two polarizations. And I'm going to get an interference pattern back here. But we have to think about that interference pattern a little bit. So let's think here. When I said when the beam goes through here, it gets sheared. When it come back, comes back, it gets unsheared. But if I look in at this sample here, I'm going to have two sheared images of the sample. The source beam is not sheared, but the images of the sample will be sheared. So I will have not just one image of the sample up here, but I'm going to have two images, one formed by one polarization, and the other one formed by the orthogonal polarization. So I'm going to have two sheared images up here. Now, in practice, the amount of shear that you normally have in a Namarsky is sort of at the resolution limit of the Namarsky. And so there will be two sheared images here, but I probably won't be able to see that with my naked eye anyway, because the shear is about equal to the resolution limit of this objective. Okay, so let's go on. Part two, how does this Namarsky work? So I say the resulting image shows the height difference between two, spatially, two closely spaced points because I have two sheared images of the sample. And so I'm going to get the interference between these two. And I go on to say that this point separation is generally about the resolution of the microscope. And so what the image is seeing is slope changes. It's seeing the difference between points on the surface separated by whatever the shear distance is. So I'm going to see slope differences, and I'm really only measuring slope in the direction of shear. Okay. So up here I'm going to see fringes that are going to tell me about the slope of the surface in the direction of the shear. How, how can I change the path difference between the two beams? Well, one way is to displace the Wollaston prism. I said that if you know light 
if I look at light going down the center, the S and P will see the same path length. Or if I look at light going down here, and then when it comes back the next time it goes here, if this prism is centered, then well, you know, S may see more path length here going through this time. When it comes back, it's going to see less. And so the thing is, if I move this sideways, I'm going to be changing the path or the phase difference between the S and the P components. So this is introducing a phase difference or path difference between the two interfering beams. So I say if the axes, uh, say the polarizer and analyzer are parallel and the prism is centered, then I'm going to see a bright white fringe uh, if the test surface has no tilt. And if the analyzer and polarizer are crossed, then fringes, instead of being bright, will be dark. And if the prism is translated sideways, now the two beams will not have equal paths, and they're going to see different colors. So I move the prism sideways. The S and P components will see a path difference, an OPD difference. And the phase difference then will be different for different wavelengths because the phase goes as 2 pi over the wavelength times the path difference. So if I change the wavelength, I will change the phase difference. And so if I move the prism sideways, I'll introduce a, a phase difference between the beams. And for some colors, the phase difference will be 180 degrees and they'll cancel out. For other colors, it will not be 180 degrees, so they don't cancel out. And so what I'm going to see will be different colors and a constant slope on the sample, constant height difference between sheared points will give a constant color. And a color change will indicate a change in the surface slope. Come back to this slide in a second. So I may see something like this. You know, different portions of the sample had different slopes and I get different colors. And I tell you, you get some of the most beautiful things you ever see in optics with a Namarsky. So I've gotten down to this point before I do the last point here. Any, any questions? Do you see how it works or not? It's a really neat device and used a lot. Any questions on it? So you see an area? You'll see an area. Yeah, I'm not illuminating just a point here. I'm illuminating an area. And so you'll see an area up here, which, you know, depending on the magnification of objective, it might be a a millimeter on the sample, it might be five millimeters on the sample, depending on the magnification. But you see an area, you'll see something that looks like this. And I, I don't have a scale on here showing how far that is, but you're seeing a few millimeters here. And as you move the Wollaston sideways, you're introducing this path difference, and these colors will change. And the last thing here, which is probably the least important, which is why I put it at the end here, if the polarizer before the prism or the analyzer before the detector is rotated, the relative intensities of the two interfering beams will change. And the colors and the contrast will, will change a little bit. Contrast goes down, so you're not completely canceling out some colors, and so the color of the image will change. But the real big effect that you see, I mean, Rotating these polarizers or analyzer makes a difference. The thing that makes the biggest difference is moving this Wollaston sideways and introducing a path difference between the two beams. Well, no, you, you don't. But you generally, you like to see, this is more of a qualitative 
test and you often like to see how the colors change and so you you often will just move this sideways and on a typical objective you move it sideways There's a little ring that you rotate and doesn't rotate the prism but it it shifts the prism sideways and you'll see a color change that that is um, very very pretty and it'll give you a feel as to what the slopes are again it's not you know you you really are, are you need a little experience to really um, make good use of this because um, you, you kind of need a little feel as to how much the slopes are changing by and whether that's important or not in the particular sample you're looking at but it's very easy very very easy to get beautiful patterns patterns any questions so this picture came from this book I told you I paid this enormous amount of forty dollars for many years ago and uh, not only did I get this picture in it volume two has color pictures in it volume one did not but I mean here's another sample and I mean and these are not these are not phony things these are you know it's uh, you just set it up and you, you see beautiful things like this here's another one This one isn't so pretty. Here's another nice one. Let's go back, just make sure we understand how this works, because it's a, it's a useful device. And I would say 95% of the people using the Marsky have no idea how it works, but you will have an idea. There's another device that uh, is, a, is like this, but not as good. And I'd be truthful, I've never seen this other device. I've never seen one, but I've read about them. And it's what's called the Franzone Interference Eyepiece. And it works somewhat similar, but I mean, here, when I did this one, I had to have a special objective here that has this prism built into it. And I had to have this polarizer and this analyzer. This Franzone system here is only an eyepiece. And the eyepiece, and so down here the source, well the source is going to have to be a slit source because it has to be narrow in the direction of the shear. And it has a in the eyepiece, it has this thing called a Savar plate, which is again a, a couple of birefringent crystals. But these are plates, not prisms. And the idea here is that the two polarizations, if I send in a collimated beam of light, I'll get two collimated beams out, and the two polarizations are sheared again relative to one another. And this dashed line means it's, it's translated in into the plane of the screen. And so what we have here, by putting this eyepiece on, again, we, well, we're going to see, going to have two images of this sample which are shifted sideways relative to one another, sheared sideways relative to another, one another. And so this has the advantage that you know, you don't, have to, you don't have to have a special objective here. You just add this to the eyepiece. But it has a big disadvantage, and it, I think this is probably why I've never seen one of these, is that I shear only once. I mean, I, I, I shear the, the image of the sample, and I shear the source beam only once. And so that means I have to have good coherence in the direction of shear. And so this source has to be a slit source. Well, the great beauty of this Nomarski is that I shear the beam and then I unshear the beam. So this source can be almost anything. You have no spatial coherence requirements on it. And we want white light to begin with. And so that source 
um, can be almost anything as long as it has a lot of wavelengths present. Um, while in the Franzone interference eyepiece, um, you have to have a slit source. Now, Franzone and Namarski were both professors at the Institut des Optiques in France. I think I think Franzone was a uh, he was the director of the institute for many for many years. They're both passed away now. Franzone has written a lot of books on um, interferometry that you'll that you'll see, and, and they're very good. He he was very good. Namarski is really famous for his for this interferometer, which has become a very very useful interferometer. I thought I'd have to tell you about one experience I had with Namarski. Um, this is back one of the very first papers, uh, one of the very first talks I gave. This was at an OSA meeting in San Francisco, I remember. And it was shortly after I got out of the college. It might have been the second or third talk I, I gave. And Namarski was there. Probably Franzone was too. They used to come to all the meetings. But Namarski had a, a habit of giving every speaker a, a hard time. And his favorite thing would be that someone would give a talk and then he'd stand up afterwards and say, are you familiar with the paper? And then he would mention some paper and generally in some Russian journal that no one had ever heard of the journal, let alone the paper. And he said, are you familiar with this paper by so-and-so in such-and-such a journal? Well, they did the same thing you did, except twice as good as what you did. Or something like that would be what he was He was just, he was terrible. So at this meeting where I gave my talk, I, my talk was on Thursday. And Namarski had been there all week doing this to people. And everyone was, was, was um, Irritated with him, I'd have to say. And, it, you know, the normal speaker would say this, no, no, I'm sorry, I just, I don't know that paper. Okay. So anyway, so I gave my talk, and I, he was in the audience, and he raises his hand, and he said, um, and he, he he's tried to tell me what I did was completely wrong. And while all week, you know, no one had really disagreed with him, I just couldn't take that because what I did was not wrong. So I just took after the guy. And um, I think anything I said, the whole audience would have been on my side, whether I was right or wrong, because they were all so tired of this guy. But anyway, so afterwards, you know, that was a, that was a, real, a real experience. I went back after him, and he was kind of taken back, and he let me alone then after that. But then a year or two later, I went to visit the Institut d'Aptique in France. And not only would he not let me visit with him, he had a, a postdoc standing in the hallway. I couldn't even walk down the hallway by his, by his lab. So I never did visit him at the Institute there. Anyway, he was quite a, quite a guy, and he, he did some very wonderful work. But I kind of think he was a little, hard to get, a little hard to get along with. So the next topic is the last chapter, or last chapter, or last topic in this chapter, I should say. And we're going to talk about an interference microscope. We've already talked about the vertical scanning interference microscope system. And we're going to talk about something similar here, but it's going to be the phase shifting version of it. And I think what I'll do, I have, I have about 10 minutes left, but that's probably not enough time to cover this topic. So I think I'm going to stop at this point, and then next class we can uh, start up here with um, section 6.7 on the interference uh, microscope. So any questions before we close for today? Okay, well, thank you for coming. I'll see you bright and early at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. <laughs>